to our Sunday night service for January the 23rd. Just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, Friday and Saturday, we have some youth that are going to Disciple Now. Y'all be in prayer for them. We do have some food pantry needs. If anybody here tonight, um, there was a list that went out on Facebook, but, there, but some people probably don't have that. So we need things like noodles and sauce instant potatoes, boxed milk, peanut butter and jelly, canned items of all kinds, and probably some frozen items if you have something that you that you would like to get for the freezer part of our food pantry. Anything like that would be appreciated. We've had a good many people that have had some needs lately, so I know that those things will be greatly appreciated for our pantry. Let's bow for a word of prayer tonight. Lord, I ask you to be with us tonight as we worship you, Lord. I ask that you just touch our hearts and our lives tonight, that the things that we hear and sing and say and do may reflect your love to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship tonight is redeemed. <coughs> Redeemed, how I love you, proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child of forever I am, redeemed.
Message for tonight, First Peter chapter one, twenty-two through chapter two, verse three. What you see in verses, the verses beginning in verse 22 of chapter 1 going through chapter 2 verse 3 is Peter addressing the word of God and how the strangers learned of their need of salvation and also not only did they learn of their need of salvation but they learned where the word came from. They learned that there were prophecies that had told how we could be saved, how we could experience regeneration, how we can experience sanctification. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. They are going to be reminded of the vehicle of their salvation. These believers were to have a changed intellectual outlook. Uh, not only were they to have a different 
worldview now based on scripture based on the bible but they were to have a changed moral life they would be different they were to be set apart they were to stand out they were to make uh, an impact and a difference in a world that was hostile and contrary to their belief system and that's what we have to understand as christians today we are in a world we are in a society where the majority of the people now are living contrary and hostile toward our belief system, what we believe, why we believe it, and how we conduct ourselves cause us to stand out and put us under scrutiny and put us in positions of facing persecution. And so we can be prepared for that, we can be ready for that, and there are ways that we are conduct to conduct ourselves even as we are enduring those things. And so let's start out reading verses 22 and 23 of 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of, in, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We do pray that you would help us to understand your word once again tonight, dear Lord. We are thankful that your word still speaks to us and gives us hope and presents us with truths that we need to apply to our lives so that we can grow and mature as Christians. Lord, help us to see the needs around us, the need to evangelize the world, the need to carry out uh, the commission that has been given to us as Christians. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a uh, pure heart and a loving heart to do this, to honor and glorify your name. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. At first, Peter is reminding the Christians in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, that were scattered throughout these, this area, this region, of where they uh, had to experience new birth, where they had to come to the conclusion, where they had to come to the realization under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that they needed salvation. That apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, they were dead in their trespasses and sin. They were forever separated from his love, his mercy, and his grace. And yet, because people like Peter had been willing to preach the word and present the gospel to them, they had experienced the new birth. And he is pointing out here, you must experience regeneration to be saved. There is no other way to be saved than the way that Peter has laid it out here for these believers in Asia Minor. When he preached the message there on the day of Pentecost, it's very possible that some of the people who made their way back to Asia Minor started churches there, and these believers came out of that experience that took place on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. And so that message has been proclaimed, that message has been given, it has been taught. Now they have the Apostles' Doctrine that they've been teaching, they have the Old Testament writings that they have that they can look at, and all of those things point to the need for regeneration, the need for salvation. And once these people that Peter is writing to here had, it, had experienced salvation, it was to completely transform their lives. That's why they were now strangers. That's why they were now pilgrims. That's why they were now exiles and aliens. And by the way, whenever we paint this picture of them being strangers or exiles or whatever word it is that your translation may use in these verses describing them, while they may be wayfaring strangers, it wasn't that they walked around destitute all the time and didn't always have clothing or food. They were in society. They were in a particular area. They were in a particular region. And while they may have been facing some economic difficulties and while they might face uh, 
ostracization from their families and all kind of other things that could have taken place, probably were taking place because they had surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. They were provided for. They were taken care of. We know from other letters that we read and, and study that the churches would band together and they would take up love offerings for one another. They would take care of one another. They would provide for one another. And so Peter is letting them know that they must experience and reminding them that they must have experienced regeneration to be saved. And he said, I'm addressing you because you have experienced the regeneration and you should always remember the what led to that. You need to remember the book. That, that's what he's going to get into here. He said, you experienced new birth, but it came because there were those who wrote down the Old Testament prophecy. There were those who recorded the Old Testament stories that told of Jesus' coming birth and his eventual death by crucifixion and his resurrection on the third day. And they prophesied all of these things. They foretold all of these things. And so you should never get over your new birth, but you should also remember the old book. Remember the principles found in the Word of God. Remember the doctrines found in the Word of God. Remember the stories and the lessons that we can learn from the Word of God. He said, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren. Once they had experienced the new birth, the transformation began to take place in their life. They were justified. Now they're in the process of sanctification. And so there's growth that should be seen in their life. It is evident by how they are now conducting themselves that a change has taken place in their life because now they're obeying the truth. Now they're doing what the old book said. They may not have used to conduct their life that way. They may not have used to base their decisions on principles found in the Word of God and directions found in the Word of God, but now they are consulting the Word of God and they are spending time in prayer and it transforms not only their mind, but they are being transformed from the inside out. And so they look at things from a different perspective. We are to look at things from a different perspective because as Peter has already pointed out, our hope is not in any, anything this world has to offer. Our hope is in Jesus. And our eternal destination is wrapped up in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we're saved, if we've already surrendered our lives to Christ, then we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've already been adopted into the family of God. We are to be conducting ourselves as citizens of heaven and so Peter is pointing all this out. And so how do we learn how to conduct ourselves as citizens of heaven? How do we learn to live according to what Peter is talking about here? It is by spending time in the old book. It is by spending time reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, meditating upon the Word of God, and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. To remember what Jesus told the disciples that the Holy Spirit would do. He would guide them unto all truth. He would convict them of sin in their lives. He would do all these things to help them to grow, to mature, and to produce the fruit that they had been placed here to produce. And these strangers, these exiles, these people that Peter is addressing here were to be producing fruit. They were to be making a difference. They were to be making an impact. They weren't to be recluses. They weren't to go off on an island somewhere by themselves. But they were going to be going out in society every day. And while, yes, they would eventually face persecution from Nero and Roman authorities and the government and all those things, most days their persecution would come from people they encountered every day. Family members that were... Uh, a part of the society there. Friends who were a part of the society there because now they're living contrary to the world system. They didn't behave themselves the way they used to. 
They are now calling sin what it is and challenging other people to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. And because of that, they would face persecution. And so they were never to forget that they had experienced the new birth and they were to keep their eyes focused on God's word and how all of that came about. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth. Obey the truth. One part of being a stranger is obeying the truth through the Spirit, doing what the Bible tells us to do, and then he says there, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. One way that these exiles, that these aliens, that these strangers would make a difference and an impact in society is whenever they gathered together in their church houses or in the synagogue or wherever it is that they gathered together and that they worshiped and fellowshiped together is that the outside world would see people that may have one time mistreated one another. They may at one time have been at odds with one another. They were a part of opposing uh, dynamics, but yet now they love one another. They are providing one for one another. They are taking care of one another. They are there for one another. And it is evident that they love one another. And there is a, a, a desire to see each other grow. That should be our desire as Christians is to see one another grow. That we would be making a difference. That we would be making an impact. That we would be being discipled so that no one is malnourished. So that no one is uh, falling apart and falling away. But that we're all growing. That we're all maturing. That we're all moving forward and progressing in our spiritual growth. So when we see someone hurting, we hurt with them. When we see someone rejoicing, we rejoice with them. Whenever someone is celebrating a spiritual victory in their life, we celebrate with them. When somebody has experienced some kind of setback or defeat in their life, we are there to comfort them and to offer them prayer and counsel. So what he goes on about in verse 23, and he said, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Too many of our denominations and churches have tried to entertain the masses when we simply need to be preaching the word of God. And we're all called to be evangelists, by the way. It doesn't have to be Billy Graham preaching a message like he used to preach or any modern day evangelist that we could think of, but Peter's saying, look, every day, look, you have an opportunity to show love to someone. You have an opportunity to offer an encouraging word to someone. You have the opportunity to tell someone of what Jesus did for you and how it came about because someone was willing to preach the word of God. Someone was willing to teach a Sunday school lesson. Someone was willing to be a part of vacation Bible school and volunteer and help out. Wherever it was, whatever they did, because of their faithfulness, because of their love, because of their willingness, you heard the word of God. And you were changed. The Holy Spirit worked in your life. The Holy Spirit did a, did a work in your life and you were forever changed. You surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and now you are alive. You were once dead, but now you're alive. And because of that, the Word not only lives and abides forever, but one day you will live forever. And you will have a glorified body, and you will be walking around on streets of gold and all the great things that we see and talk about in Scripture. And so here's what Peter is basically telling his audience and telling us. <clears throat> you were born again by the incorruptible Word of God, which lives and abides forever. You are strangers here, 
You are exiles here. You're aliens here. And life is short. You may face persecution. You may face uh, slander. You may face all kinds of different things from people you would have never expected to experience these things from. But just remember that the Word of God lives and abides forever. His Word is true. His Word is accurate. His Word will never fail. His promises are new every morning for us to think about, read over, study over, pray over, meditate over. And so let's just keep reading and trusting and learning the Word of God. Because it may be an old book. But it's still active and it still speaks because he is alive and he is active and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for you and me. And so there's reason to read the book. There's reason to study the book. There's reason to obey the truths found in the book. Because as we do that, it is a reminder to us of our new birth. He goes on in verse 24 and he said, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falleth away. Now Peter is quoting from the book of Isaiah. In the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, there's a lot of punishment, it's a lot of prophecy, but... And there's a lot of bad stuff there, but whenever you get to Isaiah chapter 40 and where he begins to quote from here, Peter does, all the way to the end of the book of Isaiah, there's hope that is talked about. The hope of the Messiah, the hope of the Savior, the hope of salvation, all these things. And so he's reminding his audience of where he's coming from here. He is reminding his audience is, Peter, that even though the flesh is as grass and the glory of man is the flower of grass and those things all wither and die and they have their seasons, the word of God in verse 25 endures forever. And so the promises that were made in the book of Isaiah, the promises that were made by the prophets in the Old Testament are coming true. He said they've come true. Everything they said would happen happened concerning where Jesus would be born, how he would be born, all those things. How he would die, all those things. You can trust the Word of God. You can trust the Old Testament prophecies. You can trust the promises. You can trust the covenants that God made with the nation of Israel. You can trust the commission that he gave to the church and the promises that he talked about with the disciples. He said, this book may be old, but it's trustworthy. It's trustworthy. You can read it. You can study it. You can meditate upon it. You can pray over it. And it will endure forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. He said, I'm not preaching anything new. I've not come up with any kind of new doctrine. I've not come up with any kind of new plan of salvation. He said, everything that you hear me say and have heard preached comes from the word of God. And so as you get into chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, you will notice the new birth must be experienced. We must experience regeneration to be saved, and we experience regeneration because someone was willing to record the Bible. These different scribes were willing to record the Bible and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and we have manuscripts and we have scrolls and we have all these accurate things that give us the Bible that we read, study, and preach from and teach from today. The new birth plus the old book leads to spiritual growth. Peter is reminding his audience that growth comes by experiencing the new birth and then living according to the old book. 
Doing what the Bible tells us to do. Relying on its accuracy. Remembering the promises. Reading through and studying what the Bible says. Highlighting promises. Highlighting things in the Psalms that you can pray over and that you can study and gain more wisdom, insight, and knowledge of. And so there is to be progression in our life. What we begin to see here is the Word of God is the instrument that the Lord uses to save us and to sanctify us, and the Spirit uses the Word to produce life. And so Peter says, not only as strangers will you be able to make a difference and an impact in the society around you because of how you love one another, but you'll also be able to make a difference and an impact in the society and the world around you and truly be the evangelist that you've been placed here to be by how you treat the Word of God. That's what he's saying here. He's saying not only should we have a love and a sincere love and a pure heart, uh, a, a pure love for one another, but we treat the word with respect, we listen to the word, we grow because we're continuing to feed that incorruptible seed. We are watering it. We are giving it the nourishment that it needs so that we grow, so that we mature, so that we progress. And so, and when he gets into chapter 2, he's about to address submission. And we won't get into that tonight, but he's going to talk about how Christians should submit to their masters. He's going to talk about how wives should submit to their husbands, how husbands should submit to God the Father. All these different things he's going to get into. And ultimately, as we get into chapter 3, Peter is going to say that we need to be ready to be a witness and give an account anytime that someone asks the question. We should be able to step in and give some kind of a testimony, share something that will help lead someone to Christ. He says, so here's what we have to do, church. Here's what you have to do. Regardless of how you may be mistreated, regardless of how you may be persecuted, regardless of how you may be perceived, regardless of whether you will be mocked or made fun of, here's some things you've got to lay aside. If you don't lay aside these things, it will hinder your growth, it will keep you from progressing, it will keep you from moving forward, it will prevent you from being the evangelist, it will prevent you from being the witness. It will prevent you from being the influence that you need to be as strangers in this world. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Wherefore, lay aside all malice. That can be tough. That can be tough, right? But think about Peter. Think about Paul. The ones that we're talking about how we're to progress and how we're to grow and, and James and even others were all basically backing one another up and saying the same thing. And so they were being mistreated by people like Nero and all these bad individuals. And they said, you know, used to, we would have uh, retaliated with malice. We might have... Uh, <clears throat> said some things about them that we shouldn't have said or tried to slander them in some way, but that's not how we conduct ourselves now. And so he said, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, that shouldn't be what the church is known for. You shouldn't treat one another with these things. And you shouldn't retaliate against persecution and suffering with any of these things. It will only hinder the influence. It will only harm the impact. It will only keep the church from being vibrant and growing 
the way that it should. It will keep you as an individual from growing the way that you should. It will keep your family from making the impact that it should make. And he said, so allow the Holy Spirit to remove these things from your life. Whenever the Holy Spirit reveals to you one of these things, confess it. Ask him to remove it and move forward. Lay aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. <clears throat> I wonder sometimes if Peter were alive today, if he would say, Christian, church, just because you have two thumbs on a social media account doesn't mean you have to post it. Doesn't mean you have to post it. Because we harm our influence, we hinder ourselves many times from making an impact and a difference by things that we express on social media. We must be careful to lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. And he goes on in verses 2 and 3 and says, As newborn babes desire... The sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And anybody who has been a parent or is a parent now here understands what Peter's talking about here. Whenever your kids were a baby, you didn't have to wonder whether they were hungry. If they weren't hungry every few hours, you were trying to figure out what was going on. Because they would cry. They would desire that milk. They needed that nourishment. They wanted to grow. And by the way, did you only feed your baby on Sunday? Did your baby only desire milk on Sunday? But somehow we as Christians have decided that really the only time we need to open our Bibles, the only time that we need to hear the Word of God is maybe once on Sunday, possibly if we're super spiritual, twice on Sunday. And man, if we're really spiritual, we'll come back on Wednesday night. We cannot neglect the Word of God. Peter said, don't neglect the Word of God. Desire the sincere milk of the word because that's how you grow. Now, I know that Paul and the writer of the book of Hebrews and other people talked about how we need to be able to get deep into the word of God and dig into the word of God and get into the meat of the word of God. And that's all true. But we should never forget the simple things that are found in the word of God as well. There are times where we just need to get back to the milk of the Word. Where we need those little reminders that help us to grow, that help us to progress, that help us to move forward. Because we as individuals are to be moving forward. We as Christians are to be allowing the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit, to produce that life, so that we're making a difference and an impact in a world that needs Christ. And why, why did Peter say that? His newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. He sums it up there in verse 3. He said, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We're not to uh, forget the vehicle of our salvation. And we're not to neglect so great a salvation as the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about. Because if we have tasted salvation and if we have read the word of God then we have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If we've experienced grace, we should desire for others to experience grace as well. We've experienced God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. God gave His only begotten Son so that you and I could experience eternal salvation. There was nothing we had to offer. God offered his best. Jesus paid it all. All to him 
we own. And that is what we see here. And as we move forward next week, we're going to get further into what Peter is trying to get these Christians to see, these strangers to see. There's a reason why he's telling them to lay aside malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings because they need to remember who they represent. Have you experienced the new birth tonight? If you have, remember the old book. Remember that it was God's word that brings it about. And remember that the new birth plus the old book leads to spiritual growth. Josh McDowell in his book, The Evidence That Demands a Verdict, said this. As we close out. The Bible compared with other ancient writings has more manuscript evidence than any ten pieces of classical literature combined. This is not only a love letter to you, it is your instruction manual. It is real, it is accurate, it is true. And every promise, every word, everything that is written was inspired to help you to grow, to mature, to progress, to make a difference, to make an impact. Let's be strangers in this world. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. As Miss Melinda comes, we pray that you have spoken to hearts here tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember the promises found in this old book. Lord, we're thankful that we've experienced the new birth and how it came about. Lord, thank you for those who were willing to preach the word before us. Those who were willing to teach the word. Those who were willing to spend time in their prayer closets praying for the preachers and praying for the salvation of lost souls. Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our lives, that we would continue to experience the process of sanctification. And Lord, we, thank, we are thankful tonight for your presence once again. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.